Okay, so correlation means to uh, establish the correlation, the strength of a correlation between two variables, whereas regression means to utilize the independent variable to predict the dependent variable. And important is to keep it kept in mind. It has the limitations just like correlation. It, it, uh, the same limitations employ, uh, apply and the same assumptions apply mainly the normal distribution that is to be kept in mind. So we're basically, we're using then standardized for the regression, we're using standardized uh, X scores and relating those using the uh, correlation coefficient, which indicates the direction of the association as set Y hat, which is our predicted Y as a function of our correlation coefficient, which kind of gives you an idea about the strength of the association, as well as the direction of this association. So it kind of gives you quote unquote an idea of the slope and um, the uh, set score of the X variable. As such, you can predict the Y and this predicted Y essentially gives you a, a linear equation that you can determine by quantifying the A, the intercept, the B, the slope. And this essentially characterizes uh, the linear function that we have uh, calculated for the example of the back depression inventory score as a function of number of stressful life events. So the idea of prediction is really that you can predict. So in this setting, it would be a psychologist who would utilize this as a prediction tool, where essentially a patient comes into his or her practice and would use the number of life events to essentially quantify how likely is that patient depressed and what degree of depression is the psychologist facing in this therapy. So this is where this becomes a useful tool. What we will be discussing today is what further can be incorporated in the regression equation to make the prediction more accurate. Because all these predictions have essentially limitations. As you can imagine, not everything is black and white, not ever, everything is easily predictable. So we have here differences in the predictive accuracy, accuracy of two different data sets. So essentially we have uh, asked ourselves the question, which figure here, the left or the right makes a strong and more accurate prediction. Given the scatter and the variability you have here on the right side, it becomes quite obvious that on the left side, you have a smaller uh, variability and you have a greater accuracy of your data. Unfortunately, not everything is as uh, easily to be predicted. And for this, uh, for this reason, there is uh, a marker of this predictive accuracy. Let's call it that way. So it is essentially the so-called proportional reduction in error quantification using the coefficient of determination, which in its simplest form, the so-called R squared in univariate analysis, where you only have one independent variable is essentially the squared correlation coefficient. This is with multivariable regression and I'm flagging this as an important take home message is not correct. So you cannot do that when you have multiple uh, multivariable regression that we will discuss later. So this is only true in simple bivariate where you have two variables uh, regression analysis. So this essentially uh, quantifies the proportion of reduction error due to um, the development and employment of this regression function. So essentially in its simplest form, and this is essentially an R square of zero, you basically, you predict your Y, your Y hat is equal to the mean of Y. So if you use the mean of Y and you just, you, you basically, you look at a horizontal line, you essentially have an R square of zero and that's the simplest form of prediction you mean to change your function by the slope and by the intercept and you shift it, you parallel shift it by the intercept and you tilt it according to the slope to essentially get a better estimate of your data and a better predictive quality of your model. And the amount of uh, additional information you gain from developing and using your model 
your linear function is called the coefficient of determination. And we have calculated this last time. I think we uh, in the F class, we did not get that far. It is part of the video, but essentially the way it's done is considerably simple. So you have, if you remember here, the calculations, you have here the BDI, you have the number of stressful life events on the x-axis. We develop the graph. We get to calculating our deviations, where essentially this deviation, this sum of square is our total variability. This is the variability if you would have used a mean as your prediction. If you say, okay, so I have, I have my population, I develop my model just based on this population. I have my uh, depression score and I quantify and predict every patient that comes into my practice just by using the mean of my population. This is the error that you will be creating, 788. That's the variation in your score, your squared error. If you use your model, you essentially only get to this error. So you have a reduction in your error. You have a reduction in your error that essentially is 788 minus 526. And this reduction in error, you utilize then to calculate this proportionate reduction, which is essentially 788.1 minus 526.6, which is this reduction by using the model divided by the total score that gets you a proportionate reduction of your error by developing a function. Kind of logical. So essentially you can look at this, this R squared as in principle, nothing else but a fraction, a proportion. So it's a proportion or if you multiply by 100, you have a percentage, right? It's a reduction of that error used by that model, by that function. And that's how it's being calculated. So essentially what you do, you calculate your error from the model alone by calculating your y hat. And your y hat is simply calculated as using the intercept here, which we quantified here. The intercept is always where the x equals zero. So you get your intercept with a prediction of y hat at x equals zero. This is always your intercept. Whereas your slope is the difference between your y hat prediction at x equals one minus your intercept. This is exactly that slope. Think about it in a, for a second, as some skeptical looks. Think about it for a second. You have the graph here. You have this intercept. This is where x equals zero. This is where this line crosses the y-axis. And this exactly here is your zero. This is this prediction of 9.54. Whereas your slope is that increase. If you, if you think of this as a little bit of a triangle, and that's how you would calculate it, essentially, if you would calculate the slope per se, I don't know who of you had calculus and, and, and knows about how to deal with equations. You essentially you can calculate it by y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. That's how you also derive that slope. The easiest way, and this is the way we did, we calculate the prediction here, prediction, we know the prediction here, we calculate the difference, comes to the slope. It's exactly that increase, right? So this being said, this is how we're calculating our y hat. That's nothing else but, uh, it'd be nice if it's on. This is nothing else but this inter and intercept plus this uh, slope multiplied by each respective x. And what you do essentially, you can then um, calculate the y hat by using this equation for each individual in your data set. So you have your one, two, four, five, zero, and you get this list of estimates which is essentially, the, these are just points on your line, nothing else. And now you're calculating the actual, the difference between the actual depression score that this individual has scored minus your estimate. So by getting, uh, by calculating this difference, squaring it, 
you get to this error of your function. That's the residual error. And yeah, so just as a recap. Okay, so this is the coefficient of determination. Easily to be calculated. Um, now we are getting a little further. We have talked about this. Yes, so the visualization of the error is essentially, so this would be, if you just take the mean, these are those errors, that uh, error that essentially occurs if you would use the mean as your predictor. If you fit your function through it, you're getting these errors. And the error summed up squared as a fraction. So the reduction of that error divided by the total error, which is this error, gets you that proportionate reduction. Any questions on that? That's quite an important concept. I'm flagging this. If no question, then we can move on. So regression to the mean. This, this comes up as a question. So it's essentially, you will find regression to the mean as questions in the test. What it means is that based on regression estimation, particularly in time series, if you have high values, they tend to revolve and minimize back to the mean, whereas very low values tend to gravitate towards the mean. This is a feature of the prediction. Uh, where essentially the prediction will, uh, uh, based on the slope and these trends from the mean, derived from the mean, will essentially make these predictions always gravitate back to the mean. So this is the regression to the mean, uh, which essentially will be basically focusing on that extremely high values over time will tend to go back to the mean because the mean may still be a solid estimate and they tend to go back to the mean. So the low ones will also increase and will get back to the mean. The example they give here is the stock market where you have this extremely high estimates, these extremely high numbers and the, the high numbers gravitate back to what is the mean whereas the low numbers gravitate up towards the mean. So it is these outliers, when you see an outlier on extremely high value and extremely low value, there's usually a reason behind it. So overall, they will always tend back to the mean because the outliers for a reason. And lastly, and that's the last part of, of, of regression that we're discussing, that it's multiple regression. We're not getting too deep into it, unfortunately, because it's actually a super important tool because when you think about it, when you want to predict something, it's seldom just one variable that predicts another variable, right? And there are statistical techniques that allow for you to incorporate additional variables. And this is really my daily bread in, in a way, because all of these predicting independent variables um, need to be chosen very, very carefully because if you put too many into your models, you get what is called an overfit. And this overfit essentially uh, makes your model quite unreliable and I would even go as far to call it useless. So the way this is done, you basically, you aligning again, all your data with the dependent, uh, the dependent variable, the independent variable, number one, and now the additional independent variable. So essentially it is important to always analyze them in a so-called long format where you have each individual corresponding with each individual entry in the variable. So here we have depression as a function of number of stressful life events. And in addition here, we have the so-called sleep disturbance scores so in addition to number of stress for life events, also if you have poor sleep, this will also contribute to your depression. So that's the idea behind this multivariable regression. And I'm also flagging this, you will see this on the quiz. That's a typical output from a multivariable regression, a multiple regression from a statistical software. 
we will use <laughs> 12 minutes to discuss that through. We will talk about the next class again, but uh, you will see it in the code. R does exactly the same thing, computing such an output. What you see in this output is essentially you have your constant. This is an SPSS term and R it's labeled an intercept. So the constant is nothing else but your intercept. This B is your intercept as we calculated it. The standard error is the standard error around this estimate of the intercept. The beta are the standardized coefficients. So that's our set. That's our set Y. Then we have a T. And this is where it's getting tricky because the residuals that are distributing around your estimate, your estimated value, no? these guys, these are residuals. This distance from this individual point to the estimated score, to the estimated uh, dependent variable, this is called a residual error. This is the residual. And these residual essentially do have a distribution. So if you just take the distance or the difference from this point to this point and this point to this point, and, and you calculate all these differences, they will have a certain distribution that again follows a normal distribution with a very characteristic mean of zero because that's how it was fit. So the mean of uh, these differences from uh, the individual points to the prediction equation will always be zero in a normal distribution. So <coughs> this is also why that fit essentially is called the least squares fit because you try to minimize the squared deviations. So you try to minimize it. That's how this line is fit in the first place. And using the least square method, as opposed to the maximum likelihood uh, method, which those of you that are analytically inclined will encounter, uh, encounter later, uh, essentially there's nothing there. Quantifies the residuals and tries to minimize those to fit that line through. Uh, so this residual errors will essentially form uh, a distribution around that function. So these differences form again a distribution curve. This distribution curve can be characterized in T's, which again will have a certain distance from zero, right? And you can quantify this as a standard error. You do this in the same fashion. You have a deviation. You can use this deviation to square. You get a sum of squares. You get a standard deviation. You get a standard deviation of these residuals. You can divide this by the sample size of uh, by the square root of the sample size of n, and you get again to a standard error, which allow for you to calculate a t. And this t is in reference to zero. This in turn will lead you to what we know well already. This is our p-value. So each individual entry, each individual variables does have a corresponding t and the corresponding p-value, which will indicate whether the predict is significant or not. And this is where, where the real difficult part of modern variable regression begins because punching that into R takes you 20 seconds. Interpreting it takes you 10 years. So, that's, so it is, this is where it's getting complicated, right? Because you need to understand why do these essentially correspond? Why are these significant? What value do they bring to your model? Because mentioned before, this overfitting, we live in a world where data is all around us, right? But finding out what data you want to include in your model, in that final model that you develop, this is, this is art and science by its own right. So we have here significant predictors. We had, as you remember, we had a significant prediction of life events predicting our uh, depression score. So now we include sleep problems. This essentially kicks out the significance of life events and makes actually sleep more important as a predictor of depression. So this is the interpretation and this, um, how to interpret this multivariable regression by basically observing your p-values. 
And this is essentially the last um, slide of Norden and Heinzen. So they basically they, uh, give examples of multiple regression in everyday life. And you will see the videos that essentially show you how multiple regression is used because multiple regression, not the multiple regression, it's essentially, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. But these models can be used to program machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms that are essentially used for driverless cars, every form of uh, application you could think of. This can range from apps and websites, prediction tools that you have on your iPhone or on, on your phone, forecasting, weather forecasts use these algorithms in addition to what you see and the trends that you see in clouds approaching the city or whatsoever. These are um, these kind of um, multiple regression analyses. Anticipatory shipping is interesting because uh, you know, larger online shops will essentially predict your shopping behavior because they will then save money on the shipping. So they know what you will buy, what the population of New York City or of uh, Lexington Avenue around 34th Street will buy in the coming week. And whatever you will be ordering on your phone, on your app, will essentially be already in, uh, in the warehouse. And the same with shopping. So essentially, whenever you uh, go shopping, uh, pharmacies, supermarkets, they know already what their customer will want to buy, and they will suggest it to you. And they will suggest particularly the ones where they earn most, where the profit margin is the largest, which is your data has been collected and your data, rest assured, your data is utilized very well. Somebody earns money with everything. Good. So this is this, we have five more minutes. All right. So practice lab five. Practice lab five essentially uses exactly the data sets that we have uh, worked with. They're mislabeled. So I saved you one additional class. So you had, um, DFM22, these are our absences. Uh, create prediction as a function of absences. Do these, two Do these two variables associate with each other can easily be quantified uh, with R by essentially analyzing it in the same fashion as we did in the past. So with LS, you remember, we get the variables included in the data frame. So LSDFM22 will get us the number of variables or the, the, the list of variables that are included in the data frame. If you want to address one specific variable, you do this with the dollar sign. You put, yes? No. You use the respective name of your data set and with the dollar sign, you indicate that the variable following the dollar sign wants to be addressed. So if you do this with DFM22 absences, it only gives you the absences displayed. Same with grade. So this is where you essentially can uh, now utilize this code to assign it. And this is the pipe that will use this vector, so this list of numbers to assign it to this new object. Yes. Uh, control enter, yes, yes, yes. No? Did you, uh, did you get the announcement? So if you just go, just, just go on the first, uh, go on two, press control and enter. Empty your environment, go on four, don't select anything, just go on four and press control and enter anywhere in the line. That should exactly do this. And then it will automatically jump from one to another. So the easiest way to run this, yes. So it's the number four, you have to be M22, like I have exactly. to create a Did you download the code from the announcement? Um, practice lab five. From the announcement? Yes. 
Ah, yes, yes. So I sent an announcement earlier today, which now, don't you get notifications? So I sent an announcement that essentially. <laughs> Yeah, so I always send it as an announcement before it has. So we can talk about it. Yes. So you're running this basically through, and you can now with the core, C O R, core function, which in, was the same essentially uh, in Excel. That was coral. Here's core. You basically correlate your correlation coefficient, which is minus 0.8. Yeah. You just, uh... Yeah, I just copied it down. Uh, the re reason for that is because I packed it here, I packed it here into a variable. So if you just write it in line 13, you press enter once, you, you write this object. This is your object that contains this correlation. So you're basically, you're running this function COR core and you're packing the result into your object. And then you can address the object by just stating the object in your line. You run it, it gives you the correlation coefficient. You can then uh, also make this um, a linear regression. A linear regression will look then essentially that way. So if you remember now from the SPSS output that I've showed you before, we had it called uh, constant, here it's intercept. This is the second variable. This is the prediction. We have an estimate, which is our slope and intercept for intercept. This is the standard error. This is the T value. That's the T score. And this is our probability P value. And yes. Okay, wait, I just went like, a little behind. So I ran everything until five seconds. Okay. And then, and then what did you just, just continue. Continue with 12, 13, 14, 15. Hmm? We're controlling, I think the beginning step, we're controlling enter every line. Yes. Or Yes, sir. But then you did like enter, like for which line? You can, yeah, I just entered. And, and the only thing I did, I entered co F1. Do we need to have it? As long as you understand that you're packing the function into your object. That is the idea. All right. You know my opinions to that. You will not need this immediately. One day you may need it, and one day this code may come useful. Trust me, if you do data analysis and you can see the R, these codes are good to have. Um, I, I taught myself R, and this was a long process to uh, get to these codes. Okay, easily you can also do this. You can essentially, uh, so if you enlarge, zoom and enlarge, you can basically, you can build that plot that we have done in Excel. You can build it with this function, line 15 in your end. Yes, this is the code. So you can basically, you can run. It doesn't display it for me because I zoomed out. So if I would do it in that way, which is a little bit harder to see, we would get here a code that basically builds our scatter plot that we've done. These are two lines of code. You remember how in Excel you needed to drag and drop, select and go on, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to do this here anymore. Are you able to, to zoom in again, please? If we're zooming in now, you can also add a text. We don't need to do this. Okay, so this was the absences example. It follows the same principle as the practice labs, right? So we have um, the same individual, uh, the, the, the same example as DFM23, that's our regression example. So we have now the correlation, we're building up the correlation, we're building a linear mixed uh, linear regression that essentially is consistent with the one that we have seen in 
Lauren and Heinzen slides. This is the multivariable model. So with uh, so we're building FIT 2A, which contains the univariate model. We're building FIT 2B, which contains this uh, multivariable model. With LM, you indicate to R that this is a linear model it's supposed to build. You uh, you start the code with uh, adding here the dependent variable with this so-called mathematical tilde. You indicate that this dependent variable is being analyzed as a function of whatever follows this tilde. So it follows the uh, so the dependent variable is predicted here by events and by the sleep disturbance core. This builds your um, uh, multivariable model. You have with the plus, you indicate that additional parameters are following. If you're running this model now, you see the same data as shown by Nolan and Heinzen. On the slide, you have again estimate for both variables. You have a standard error for both variables. You have T values for both variables, and you have the corresponding T value. And the results are the same. The sleep disturbance trumps the uh, life events. Life events not significant anymore, whereas the sleep disturbance score becomes significant. You can, in addition to that, build what are labeled here as diagnostic plots. Diagnostic plots essentially are plots that show you how does your model perform. Um, if I find the model at one point, yeah, here we go. Okay. So here we have residuals versus fitted. Oh, yes, there's a question. So, Sylvia, that's a very good question. The difference between multivariable regression and ANOVA is the multivariable regression uh, deals with continuous variable, whereas the ANOVA has groupings. So you can, in multiple regression, you can combine groupings and continuous variable, but uh, there are some similarities to that. Essentially, when you uh, have a group, you essentially, you can analyze whatever we analyzed with ANOVA, you can analyze this uh, also with a regression method. Well, basically the group, this nominal variable group, acts as a categorical variable in your multiple regression. So this is also why the marker of the effect size is essentially the same for both, right? So you have the proportional reduction of error from your model, and this essentially is uh, equal to the effect size in the ANOVA, just in a much different magnitude because the ANOVA essentially is not explaining as much of these trends that you're observing and of this, uh, of these differences between the groups, whereas the uh, multiple regression does explain additional uh, variability using the continuous variables. Does that answer your question, Sylvia? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I can't hear you. Right. I can't hear you, Sylvia. Yeah, sure. Okay, well, we can have a longer conversation about it. Um, if you stay on after, we can talk about the differences between ANOVA and uh, multiple regression in more detail. So we have now, uh, in addition to that, we get your fitted value, we get standardized residuals. We, uh, these diagnostic plots are basically analyzing that linear model and how well it performs. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting exercise to look at these models. Why do I not see this? Here we go. Okay, so these are different ways how you can look at your uh, fitted values and you're comparing your fitted, fitted values. So if you have standardized residuals, you essentially you can see how do these residuals change with increasing in the magnitude of your estimate. So this is important if you have, for example, a regression to the mean phenomenon, you can quantify whether with an increasing measure, uh, increasing magnitude of whatever you measure. In our case, the, the BDI score, the back depression score, if, uh, if that residual and the prediction quality changes with an increase in the estimate. 
which is one of the problems you have. Then we have here in addition, okay, we don't need that. That's the weight of each residual uh, in the greater model. So we don't need this. So these are the diagnostic plots. Okay, questions? Yes. Um, can you annotate like pictures of the graphs also? Or? Uh, yes. Uh, if if you yeah, just the scatter plots. How should we like enhance that? Image? Uh, you can save this as a PDF. If you have here a scatter plot, for example, and you go and plot, you run 16, 17, 18, you get here this plot. And you can, um, here when you go on export, you can save it as a PDF file. Do you save all of them? No, I just save as each individual, but it's just two scatter plots, right? Okay. It's the scatter plot for uh, the absences. Hmm? Uh, just go back to the code and run the code again. So again. Yes, yes, yes. So it's line 16 and uh... Uh, 15. And then it's actually, if you if you added COF1, so this plot, app line, and text indicates one graph. These three lines are one graph. Plot, app line, and text. Where plot is the actual plot, app line is the line that is fitted through the scatter. And you have with text, you're building uh, this correlation coefficient. And you add it to your graph. So, so if you uh, want to look at it, uh, so this is plot, then you only see the points, right? It builds out dependent variable, independent variable. Dependent variable, independent variable is Y. That's the grid. Then you have app line fits the line through and text, that's the text. So this is the correlation coefficient, right? So these three lines will build the graph. And then it just, hmm? just these two, yeah. So there's one for DFM23 and one for DFM22. So you say you do file save? Exactly, you go on export, export, save as PDF. And here you can export it as DF, save it as DFM22 plot or something. What's your name? Please. Okay, any questions? Yeah, more questions? It's kind of simple, right? It's, it's, it's actually, if, if you go through it one by one by one and you look on the console, what actually happens with each step, it's quite self-explaining what it does. Okay. Okay, once again, let's walk through it once again. So we have on line two, we have the removal of all objects. That's RM list equals LS, we've done that. DFM22, line four, basically builds the data set. LS just gives an overview of the variables. DF absences, this is just calling all these uh, respective variables and packing them in objects. DFM22 grades, same story. You basically, you're packing this in your grades and in your objects. Then you basically running COF1, this is calculating with the core function. This is calculating your correlation coefficient. So saves you all these different steps that we did in Excel. Fit one builds you the model. Summary fit one is basically addressing the model and is summarizing the models for all the variables you're interested in. Um, so here, this is called, this is the formula. The residuals are essentially the residuals around your fitted line. So this is the distance from each individual point to your fitted line. And as said, this distributes, or it's supposed to distribute in a normal function, which is not strictly true because the median should then be equal to the mean. The mean is zero. 
the median is not equal. So it's not strictly normally distributed, but normally distributed enough to get away with it. So you have here the coefficients for estimates, standard error, uh, T score and P value with some significance code. You have here a residual standard error on eight degrees of freedom. Don't forget, if you do correlation, if you do independent sample t-test, if you do multivariate regression, you remember we had with the independent sample t-test, actually in, in, interesting follow-up to, to the quiz. If you have an independent sample t-test, you have two independent groups, you have two sum of squares. That means that your degrees of freedom total is all entries, meaning the number of group one, group two, minus two, instead of uh, the single sample t-test where we, for example, had a uh, number of entries minus one. So also, if you have an independent sample t-test, another follow-up from the quiz, if you have an independent sample t-test, you're calculating three degrees of freedom. You have the degrees of freedom of x, the degree of freedom of y, and you have the total degree of freedom, which is the sum of dfx and dfy. So they're in total three. Also, please pay attention when, when you read a question, read the question very, very carefully because uh, a greater sign or a smaller sign makes a difference in its interpretation. So that can be tricky. Um, good. Any questions to anything? We can continue this code. There is the correlation coefficient, but it basically is redundant. And then you have on line 34, you have the diagnostic plot. And these you don't need to export, but look at them. You have to press enter. So when you run them, you see that it oops. You see when you run the whole thing, you get here prompt, hit return to see next plot. So you need to press to get through these plots. Otherwise it gives you an error. And it shows you the different plots. And it shows you these different diagnostic plots. And the diagnostic plots are nothing else but an analysis of the residuals, which you don't need to interpret at this point. You will need to at one point. Okay. And you anxious to leave for your event. All right, have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the console, uh, last, last follow-up, uh, select everything from the console. That's the code that we ran, right? Yeah. And then just like this. And these two, add them to the solution. Yeah. That's it, yes. So I want to make sure it's not to go forward. Okay. Is that? Oh, yeah, that's not, that looks yeah. good. Yeah. 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 Uh, did you Sorry. run all of it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Yeah. You have the diagnostic plots all around. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. No, 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 you will not be able to edit to the text edit. Uh, you would need to submit it with the submission. Yes, just add it to the submission. That's fine. Julia, any questions? Um, no, I don't have any questions. I can't hear you. What? Can you can you hear me now? Right, for some interest, in the microphone doesn't work. Hold on. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, No, it should actually. Do you have a question, Julia? Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, wait. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Um, I have a question about the practice lab and submitting it. Do you just do you, <coughs> excuse me? Do you just want us to submit the the plots separately no. from the R no. code? No, you want exactly yes. So that the 
uh, the blots separately from the R code. So you have, you have here in the console, you ran the code and it follows the same outline things. It follows the same outline as with the previous labs. You basically copy the entire output in a text file and then you export the two graphs, the two scatter plots. Scatter plot one for DFM 22 and scatter plot two for DFM 23. And these three items we submit. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Great. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Once again, I'm repeating. We essentially we get from building the data frame, we're removing all objects. We are building the data frame. We're analyzing all objects, sub objects contained in the data frame. We're running each individual. We're packing these using here the pipe into the object. We have uh, now separate objects and with the pipe, you can always pack variables into objects. You can pack into objects essentially what you want. And here we're packing the actual coefficient, the error correlation coefficient into coef1, which can then be run independently as in line 13. We're building then next, we're building linear models using create as the dependent variable and absences as the independent variable with the so-called LM function. This will basically pack this linear model into fit one and summary of fit one will give us an output of that model. We're seeing residuals, we're seeing coefficients with estimates, standard error, T values, which is the distribution of the, the residuals and the corresponding P value. We're having now the plot, the plot line essentially builds the plot with X defined as our independent variable and the grade here as the dependent variable. X lab is basically labeling these axes. With app line, you essentially you fit a line through your scatter, which we see here. That's the scatter with that slope that we quantified in our model. With text, you're essentially adding text that contains the information you want to show to your reader which is essentially your correlation coefficient. And you can define and customize the text as you want to show it. You can DFM23 will build the data set. CoF2 does the correlation again, and you build another linear model for the depression score as a function of the life events, stressful life events. You get the estimate as we have quantified it uh, with uh, Excel. We're getting this plot. We're getting exactly that data depicted. Line 27, 28, and 29 is basically building that plot that is to be submitted. We can now move on. Thank you. To, we can now, in addition, build the multivariable regression model, which is line 30, gets us exactly the same estimate as shown by Norman and Heinzen. We can then, in addition, look at diagnostic plots that essentially allow us to analyze the residuals versus the predicted and fitted variables in various ways and functions. Yeah. The analysis of this, the analysis of those are beyond the scope of this class. So you essentially uh, are asked to submit then the output here in the console, you select everything and you copy paste it into a text file. And lastly, you also export only the scatter plots, which essentially is here, this line from plot to app line and text, or here, 16, 17, 18, plot, app line and text. That is practice lab number five. Reach out to me in case of questions.